This week's episode is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania in Big Trouble. The Boston Strangler trailer is out, a ranking of the best movies shot in Massachusetts, and how you could buy everything, everywhere, all at once. This is The Hub on Hollywood. I'm James. I'm Jamie. I hope I have enough money to buy all those things. <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> anywhere, all at once. Here we go. Let's go. All right, welcome back to another episode of The Hub on Hollywood. Jamie, this has been a week of high highs and low lows when it comes to my moving watching experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether it was Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is getting mixed reviews, or the nine-time Oscar-nominated film, The Banshees of Inishirin. Uh, that was an incredible movie and a movie that we will review on this on this episode, which I highly recommend everybody should watch. But they need to watch it with subtitles because those Irish accents can be <laughs> tough, tough to follow. Hi, <laughs> Jimmy. Have you heard the buzz around this movie? I haven't. I haven't. But um, I love anything Irish. What What is this one about? <laughs> So we'll get more into it, but basically it's about two friends uh, ending a relationship, a best friend relationship, and it's funny, it's horrific, it's everything (laughs) that that we all want. (laughs) Um, We'll get into all of that, and uh, but one thing that we will get into right now uh, is what everybody has been talking about, and that's Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Uh, This has been a very highly anticipated film for the past year or so, and you haven't seen it, but I'm sure you're still dying to to go out there maybe yeah maybe perhaps i don't maybe. know the, the reviews are mixed uh i never actually uh you know you can hate me for this or not i never actually went out and saw the other ant-man movies but mm-hmm. the hype around this one has been like so big right they're hyping this and and in billing it as something that's going to set up the rest of the mcu or the next phase of the mcu you yeah. saw it does it meet the hype no, it doesn't, unfortunately. No. Now, this is not... Now, I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's no Thor, Love, and Thunder. It's no The Eternals. I would say it's better than those movies. Hey, However, I love Thor, Love, and Thunder. <laughs> you like Love, and Thunder? I despise I love, love, and Thunder. I'm, oh, not, I'm not a big fan. Maybe maybe then you'll love this movie. But okay. um, it feels very anticlimactic. Anticlimactic. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Get it? Well, yeah. Because this is, they were basically selling this movie as the launching of the next fi- uh, the next phase, phase five of the MCU. And it does that, but it's very underwhelming. And I think a lot of people uh, are also feeling the same way. Like we mentioned, it has a 48% tomato meter from the critics' point of view, 83% from the audience score. However, it is suffering a rough second weekend in the movie theaters. According to the box office, the Marvel sequel had an 83 83- Three percent drop on its second Friday at the box office, which isn't terribly unusual. But when you hear a mix of uh, of bad, good reviews, uh, non glowing reviews, um, it's, it shouldn't be too big of a surprise to see that drop in popularity uh, really go down after the first week that it debuted. Now, but, I just want yeah. to amend what I just said. Uh, no, I love Thor <laughs> Ragnarok. Sorry, Ragnarok. Right, yes, right. Love and Thunder was. Uh, I can see that. But, okay, so here's my question. We're not going to get into spoilers or anything here. Did you feel like it didn't meet your expectations because it's stretched and they tried to, like, pack too much in and it didn't flow with the story? Or was it just just not climactic, just not exciting enough? Yeah, it felt the the movie didn't feel very tight. It felt like they were going in different directions and and they were trying to fix it. Uh, the final version in the editing process. Um, there are many parts where I'm like, okay, let's get past this. Like this is kind of like w- there is one point where where the original Wasp, and this isn't really a spoiler, but the original Wasp played by Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, she, as we know, in the previous Ant-Man movies and the previous Avengers movies, uh, she was stuck in the quantum realm for 30 years or so. And when she comes out, she apparently has never talked about what happened in the quantum realm, realm, and but she's afraid something terrible is down there. And mm-hmm. when the, everybody gets sucked down there, everyone's asking her like, "Hey, so what's going on? What's what? What's this? Where are we going? What's the big deal? Why are you so freaked out?" And for 
in the first 45, 50 minutes of the movie, she's not, she refuses to, to, to tell anybody. And so there's this mystery that's like, why are you keeping it a mystery? Like, you're down there, tell them that Kang is the big bad and why, you know, you're really scared. Instead, she just prolongs and, and extends mm. this mystery for no reason. And so there are things like that where it just felt very... Uh, again, it wasn't structured very well or the pacing wasn't working. And plus, you know, Kane the Conqueror, played by Jonathan Major, is, you know, really is a really cool character. But the ending was very underwhelming as, you know, when Thanos was first introduced, we were like, oh, man, we can't wait for the next uh, movie to come out after Infinity War to see what happens in Endgame because Thanos was such a major, incredible character and, and he left such an impact at the end of the first movie. You can't wait to see the next one. At the end of this one, I'm like... Okay, well, I'm not really. I'm very underwhelmed with mm. the rest of the with the rest of the phase as it's planned out right now. So mm. it's. I think it's a good. It's a. I'll. I will. I will go as far as say it is a good movie. It's fun, but for what it promises, it doesn't deliver. Mm. I'll, I'll leave it there. But Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, it was the number one movie in the box office this week. Cocaine Bear was the second movie uh, at <laughs> yes. the box office projected to make $20 million. That's getting, uh, I'm not sure if it's surprising, but pretty positive reviews because it's one of those movies where like, you know what, what kind of movie you're going into. Cocaine Bear. Okay. Like a Sharknado type of, Yeah, you get the of, gist of, of it. It's essentially the, a, a bear accidentally <laughs> ingests all this cocaine and goes absolutely nuts on a town. The, the only difference here, um, this is, I think, based on a true it story, is. right? So, so. <laughs> the, and so you know, you know, it's funny when movies say they're based on a true story. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly, exactly what, what happened. happened. Right. Because in the real life story, there was a bear that ate a bunch of cocaine and it died. In this movie, the bear doesn't die; it just goes on a cocaine rampage, and so yeah. then, and then everything else ensues. But it's getting um, a pretty, you know, again, pretty positive reviews for what kind of movie it is. So that's right. a movie I, I'll probably check out at my local theater. But talking about what things we will be checking out soon and very soon, that is coming out next month, is the return of the Mandalorian uh, for its third season. Thank God. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, we had a little bit of um, Baby Yoda and Mando taking over the Boba Fett series, which was a little odd, but Very. also fun. Uh, it's not often that a whole other character from a whole other show like completely hijacks the end of your <laughs> series. Um, but we got a little advancement in, in, in that story, and now we finally get to see Mando and Baby Yoda together, um, because... Pedro Pascal proving that there is no amount of there there is no amount of too much Pedro like there is no there is no way to have too much Pedro Pascal. No. And the chemistry that he has with Baby Yoda, the chemistry that he has with anyone. Okay, he just exudes. He is dripping with that that charisma, that Chilean charisma that he has, right? Um, that he brings to the big screen. So very excited to hear that. And also very excited to hear filmmaker John Favreau talking about this series and that we may get a lot more in the future. That a lot more maybe, there is no yeah. no no end in sight for uh for, for Mando <laughs> And uh, Grogu. Yeah, so yeah, so Favreau was talking to Total Film, and he says that although there will be a resolution for the characters over time, it's not like they're building to something that they already have in mind. So he says that they have stories that will go on and on uh, for a while. So we're going to be getting a lot more Pedro Pascal. Not sure how much more Baby Yoda, because as you may remember, I was not a, a huge fan of when Mando popped into Boba Fett, and they and they reunited. Mando and baby Grogu just mm. right after he dropped them off with with Luke I thought that could have gone into like a whole different like adventure story of Mando you know being separate from that and I mm. thought it would have been it left a lot of mystery of like what happened to to Grogu when the Jedi Temple fell because of Kylo Ren and all that stuff but you know mm. we got what we got and we're gonna get a lot more of it according to John Favreau uh, by the well, way did you know mm -hmm. that uh Pedro Pascal is known as the internet's daddy <laughs> I was gonna bring this up. I, I was, I swear. Yes, I may or may not have been on a YouTube bender the last <laughs> week, just watching Pedro interviews. And um, yes, they love to bring this up. And it's true. I mean, from, from Grogu 
to Bella Ramsey in The Last of Us as as Joel in in that one. I mean, it's a winning formula. You put yeah. Pedro with with a, a you know a younger person or or a child or a baby, and he is daddy. He just is daddy. <laughs> Not only is he daddy, but he's also zaddy. Have you heard yeah. of this? Yeah, yes. zaddy. Is that a Gen Z thing? Gen Z zaddy? Yeah, it's so it's like a um, an older daddy, it's like an older, sexier daddy. Um, I I don't know. I just I agree with this a hundred percent. It seems like you're <laughs> on the on that train too. I mean, I wouldn't call him a daddy personally, but I acknowledge <laughs> that he does have daddy esque features and abilities. It was funny. He was on the Graham Norton show recently, and he said that he's still trying to figure out what a daddy or a zaddy is, and that he yeah. actually, uh, uh, I think it was a Helen Mirren who was sitting next to him. She goes, oh, "Maybe you're a saddy," and he's like, "Yeah, if anything, I'm more of a saddy than a Aww. daddy." But he does accept uh, the title that yes, the internet but- has given him. <laughs> Also, Oberyn Tyrell of Game of Thrones, and he, you know, he's just been in all of these huge series and enterprises, and he has such a great attitude. You know what yeah. I mean? So he he attracts uh, people to him. So I did see an interview that he did alongside Bella Ramsey, where they were talking about the term zaddy, and the interviewer kind of went off the rails a little bit. She's like, "Oh yeah, it's like an old man, but who's hot, like an older dad." <laughs> and he was like so mortally offended. And he's like, I don't even have kids. And she's like, and she kept just digging the hole, like, but we're all your kids. And he's like, okay. And Bella's like, yeah. cut it out. Stop, stop. Like, <laughs> so, you know, you know, yeah, you know what I want to see uh, when I think about like also just like the, just how awesome Pedro is and other actors that are very similar to him. Oscar Isaac, who was, of course, Poe Dameron in Star Wars. He was in Ex Machina. He's in Dune. Uh, him and Oscar are, and him and Pedro are actually really, really good close friends. So I would love to see like a buddy cop or like a buddy yeah. buddy movie with those two guys on there. Because whenever they do an interview together, it goes off the rails, but in the best possible way. Yeah, because they're just the two Latin heartthrobs that are taking over Hollywood together, um, <laughs> and they've got this real life you know, friendship that is absolutely uh, wonderful. Pedro is Chilean and uh, the other one. <laughs> Oscar Isaac. Oscar Isaac is from Miami. He's, from, he's half uh, Cuban, half uh, Ecuadorian, I believe. It's wonderful to see their chemistry together. Oscar calls Pedro his girlfriend in a lot of <laughs> interviews also. Um, so yeah, seeing them on screen together would be just the best that would just be amazing so let's hope for that in the future pedro will be the daddy and oscar will be like the little girl i don't know something you know, <laughs> okay be the child. that may be an interesting very interesting movie to pitch all right i'm gonna start <laughs> writing that screenplay um it's a little fanfic it's, yeah exactly that fanfic right because that's not gonna see the light of day anyway we've gone off the rails here on the hub on hollywood how much do you love pedro and oscar and what do you need to see them in next what big enterprise series or whatever do you need to see them in um poe dameron right and the mandalorian do they cross paths at any point where what is the timelines here I think I think uh, Mandarin Mando is older. I think it takes place like eighteen years before. Um, right, that's true. right. So so he may be an older man. He may be an older Zaddy, <laughs> Zaddy to to Oscar Isaac's Poe Dameron. Um, but I'd watch that. I'd, I'd still watch that. All now, right. let's get her done. Baby uh, Grogu will still be there because Grogu lives like a thousand years. So Grogu or is does Grogu he? is Zaddy. If not for Kylo Ren, we'll see what happens to, to Grogu. Uh, but talking about some other amazing stuff, um, you know that I'm a big fan of this amazing movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, also nominated for several Oscars. And I, I couldn't stop talking about how great this movie is. And if you, too, are a big fan of this film, you can actually buy a little bit of Everything Everywhere All at Once thanks to an auction that's up right now, up and running, so you have time to to place your bets uh, is that what's that what you do you place your bet place your auction uh, i don't know the, the right verbiage but you put money down because yeah, the writers yeah. and the directors um place your they bets. took they got everything from uh the boulder with googly eyes to a uh, rakakuni uh and put it up on the auction block and so right now looking at the website where this is going off for another, as of this recording, another five days and three hours. But some of these things are going for a ridiculous price, but I can believe it because people love this movie. There's this scene, and if you actually check out our Twitter page, our our banner photo is of 
uh, the boulder with googly eyes. And so they call this the Rock vs. Rock. And Jamie, how much would you guess this the current bid is for this boulder with two googly eyes on it? Listen, I can go outside and buy some googly eyes and put them on a rock. I, I don't know that I would pay that much, but let me see. I'm going to venture a guess. Five grand. Ooh, uh, and, and you're in the you're in the ballpark, but it's okay. uh, it's more than that. It's uh, going for eighty seven hundred dollars, so eight thousand oh, okay. seven hundred bucks for this for this small boulder with googly eyes. But they have a bunch of other uh, great props from the film, including the Alpha Verse headset, which is going for twenty five hundred bucks. Now this one is pretty crazy. Now I'm not sure if you could pull up the website, but there is the Auditor of the Month trophy and this trophy is used in a very uh, pivotal moment in the film where uh -huh. a character gets that stuck inside them and uh, if you're looking at this object <laughs> yeah, you, you, it looks very similar to um, to a uh, basically a, like a sex toy and this thing is uh, again this is the auditor of the month trophy but it's going for $14,000 at the current bid that's quite a lot of money for uh, this kind of object. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, um, again, you could get that for a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> you can make your Just own for like maybe like 50 bucks or something. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a trophy though, right? So they've got it on, on top of like a little plaque. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very it says phallic auditor shaped. of the month. <laughs> yes, this little phallic shaped. Um, it's a butt plug, people. Okay, it's a butt That's plug. Thank you, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for <laughs> saving me. Yeah, it's a, it's a basically a butt plug, but it's on a on a on a award uh, right, right. stand. On, uh, yeah, mm -hmm, exactly <laughs> on on a, the base of a plaque, and um, it's. Fourteen thousand dollars, if if that's your jam, um, that's you know, and you've got that much money right, lying around. You know what I could do with fourteen thousand dollars? A lot. Yeah, I, I just, I wouldn't spend it on a buck plug. You can plug. buy a lot I'm of buck plugs saying. with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that one's a crazy amount. I'm not surprised that Wayman's fanny pack is going for $8,000. But at the moment, um, again, there's so this isn't a spoiler per se, but in the film, um, there's a character based loosely off Ratatouille. Uh, uh -huh. But in this one, it's called Rakakuni. So basically, oh. it's a raccoon that sits on top of your head kind of controlling you and this one not surprised is kind of surprised it's going for ninety thousand dollars raccoon ninety thousand okay. dollars for a stuffed raccoon as i was looking through these items that was like the only one like i wanted and then i saw the price <laughs> and um i you know look yes these movie props very expensive uh you know it's going for a good cause, is what is what I'm saying. So mm. uh, it's not like this is just going into some collector's back pocket. Um, all of the the proceeds are going to be used for the Asian Mental Health Project, aimed to educate and empower Pan Asian communities um, seeking mental health care. Of uh, you know a wonderful cause, you know to 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 raise this kind of money for. However, so if you <laughs> say, if, for example, say if you had bought the uh, Auditor Award. Uh, of the month trophy and somebody asks you like hey so i heard that you bought an item that went to this great charitable cause what did you buy would you would you tell would you tell people what you bought <laughs> yes well first You're we like, would have to make sure that all the children are out of the room right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, ha it would have to be the right kind of people right right you, you, there are some people who are a little uptight <laughs> <laughs> they might have one of these stuck up their bum. I don't know. Uh, but you know, it's got to be the right kind of people. And then I would show them what, what I purchased to help uh, donate to this great and uh, worthy cause. <laughs> and there you go. Well, this auction is still up. And uh, you have your chance uh, at this moment to to buy something. You can go to a24auctions.com slash auctions slash mementos dash multiverse. If you are a big Everything Everywhere All at Once fan. All right, so I don't know how to transition from this topic to uh, to our next. From butt plugs to Boston Strangler, there is no way that we can make this transition uh, not uncomfortable. So let's just seamless. dive right into it. Yeah, so seamless. We're the best. <laughs> there we, we had we really had to work on that, people. Um, so the first trailer is out 
for Boston Stranglers starring Kira Knightley. This was shot in and around Boston, uh, which was really fun because we got to see lots of neighborhoods that were transported back in time that were yeah. dressed up where you had the cars from like the, the, the 50s and 60s. Um, this is a very well done period piece uh, from what I have he- seen and heard of it. So why don't we go ahead and dive right into this trailer, and then we'll talk about the story behind it and what we can all look forward to. But Boston filmed, Boston Strangler, starring Kira Knightley. Here we go. If I'm ready when you are. All right. Three, two, one. The city is for some glamorous, stimulating, prosperous. Only recently has it become dangerous. A little original. Something. Three women were strangled over the last two weeks. You're on the lifestyle desk. You're not covering a homicide. I think the murders are connected. Another woman was strangled. Just came over the wire. I'm killed in the follow-up. You don't have a story. How many women have to die before it's a story? This looks great. Color-wise, tone-wise. Police aren't talking. Never seen them this tight-lipped about anything. I don't care if it's one killer or four. We're going to catch whoever did this. You have the suspect. Boston police, hands on the wall. We had him. We just let him walk away. Everything lines up with him. His history, the progression of the crimes, everything. What do you think you're going to find out there? When is this going to stop, Loretta? I need you to call in a favor. Pick this apart. You really want to use this paper to tear down the police department. If anyone else was blowing it this Lots of great Boston locations, like you said. Time ago. I need you to take down an address. If I don't call back in an hour, give it to the police. Loretta. There's more than one lunatic out there, and you're going to get us both killed. A safe little world is just too... The cinematography looks stunning. No, it looks really good. Kira Knightley playing the intrepid reporter, uh, Loretta McLaughlin, who broke the story of the Boston Strangler. Um, it was a series of attacks on um, a number of women. They were all killed in the same way and assaulted and killed in the same way. But she was the one who connected the dots, right? This reporter was the one who cr- connected the dots. And in, in a very male dominated world, these assaults were essentially being ignored completely while this predator was out there yeah. breaking into homes um preying on on these random women mostly older women one of the great journalists of the 20th century and one of the highest profile serial killers in the United States all of this happening right here in Boston so it is going to be fascinating to see uh you're right a very dark tone that is nicely reflected cinematographically is that a word cinematographically yeah cinematography yeah (laughs) yeah so i'm really looking forward to this one for sure great supporting cast experienced character actors and a lot of local talent uh too in both supporting roles and in background this one is going to be fun to see yeah this is coming out on hulu march 17th now i wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised if there was like a push to get this uh played in some theaters locally here in boston because looking at the trailer watching it like you said, the cinematography is really good. Uh, the tone, the uh, the acting, it seems very top notch. And so I, I, you know, this is kind of movie that I would love to see in theaters. Yeah, and I think um, if they did end up uh, playing it locally, we would definitely have to be there because it's it's a great opportunity for the people who live here that worked on the film to have their red carpet moment, you know, and to have that red carpet event. We were there at the uh, the premiere of Spirited which was also filmed right there in downtown Boston. And that was just great. Uh, Besides the fact that we were grossly underdressed, um, (laughs) you got to see all of these people in their gowns and having their moment. Um, So we would love to be there for uh, the next one. If they do have a a local showing of this, if you hear about it, reach out to us here on the Hub on Hollywood. Uh, Were you in the Boston Strangler? Do you know someone who gets to have their moment on screen in this film? 
Also reach out to us. We're everywhere that you want to be. We're on Instagram, Facebook. We're on TikTok. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. We're on all the streaming services, the major streaming services, iHeartRadio, iTunes. Drop us a comment, a like, a share. Uh, let us know what's going on. And if you want to be on the Hub on Hollywood, we will absolutely uh, put you on the air. Yeah, if you didn't catch the the last week's episode, we did talk to the filmmakers and actors with uh, The Killers Next Door, and that was a really good interview. Great job on the interview, by the way, Jamie. So if you have not seen Thank it, you. go go back there, watch it. Uh, really good stuff. And so you, you, your family, your friends who have participated, who have worked on some of these local projects, we would love to have you on. So reach out to The Hub on Hollywood. Now, let's talk about some other of the, uh, the most famous movies shot in Massachusetts, because we have a plethora of them going back to the 60s to this past year. Mm-hmm. So Bent, Massachusetts found the 10 highest ranked movies shot in the state based off of the IMDb rating, Rotten Tomato audience score and critic score, box office, as well as Oscar recognitions. And a lot of, um, of course, the classics, you, you would expect to find Goodwill Hunting on this. You would expect to find The Social Network on this. But there are a couple others that I was a little surprised made the top 10 list. And we could start with the first one that came out in 1966 that shot in Northampton. Uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Winner mm-hmm. of five Oscars. Uh, Jamie, this is a movie, admittedly, I have not seen. It stars Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, George Siegel. Uh, again, uh, shot in 1966 about a bitter aging couple. And with the help of alcohol, use their young house guests to feel anguish, emotional pain towards each other over the course of a night. Have you seen this movie? No, it's, it's definitely an oldie. Yeah. I've heard of it. I have not seen it. It surprises me that that's the plot of it. Um, And it also surprises me that it's number one, seeing as uh, I would say the majority of people that I know have have never seen it before. It does have an 8 out of 10 ranking on IMDb. And I think for its time, it was pretty uh, impressive, I would say. I know I did look at the trailer before recording. And it's one of those, it, it, it was made during a time when trailers we're not the trailers that we see today. They're basically saying Elizabeth Taylor stars in this film with co-star Richard Burton and George Siegel in this <laughs> masterclass acting pl- movie based on a play. And so it's very 1960s era. Like you, yeah. And they're just random shots of these characters screaming and laughing uh, maniacally. And <laughs> apparently that was enough to get people into the movie theaters back then. And so uh, the trailer didn't sell me just because it wasn't it didn't really give much of the feel or or you know the premise of the story so um it may take me a while to to search for that one and watch that one on the list uh but number two again no shocker filmed right here in boston goodwill hunting with our boston boys ben affleck and matt damon absolutely of course that's the one that i was expecting that would be uh number one um it's a screenplay that they wrote together launched their fame our good local boys here so uh goodwill hunting number two on that list uh followed by the sound of metal i haven't seen this one either yeah, so this was filmed in Ipswich. Uh, it's an Ipswich-based story about a rock drummer who loses his hearing. Uh, the lead performer is Riz Ahmed, who earned an Oscar nomination for this performance. I have not watched it, but I hear really good things about it. So Sound of Metal is one of those, you know, eventually I'll get to. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the, <laughs> you know, I'm not rushing to uh, to the streaming services to watch it, but I hear it's a really good movie and um, properly on this list, according to Bet Massachusetts. But coming in number four, as we mentioned, The Social Network, the story of Mark Zuckerberg's rise with Facebook. Meteoric rise. Yeah, yeah meteoric rise. And so this earned eight Oscar nominations and, of course, shot around Harvard mm-hmm. and so many other iconic places in Cambridge. Uh, so number meteor- five. Uh, sorry. I, I just want to say that that phrase, like meteoric rise, don't don't meteors fall, like not rise. <laughs> I'm just saying just like sleeping like a baby. Babies don't sleep. Have, do you, ha, The person who came up with that that uh, phrase never had a baby. But as you were mentioning, I'm sorry I ran yeah. you over. No, uh, no, it was an excellent yeah. shower thought. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm just saying. Um, I'm, I'm not wrong. No. Coming in at number five, Little Women, which was a big hit with audiences and critics, starring Saoirse Ronan, Emma Watson, Florence Pugh, and Timothy Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> no, oh, and it's Timothée, okay? Timothée Chalamet. 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 Chal
Uh, <laughs> really good movie. I really enjoyed this movie. I watched the original yeah. uh, version of it that came out in the ni- in the nineties with like Kirsten Dunst, um, mm-hmm. and also Kira Knightley was in that movie. Also, I think if I'm yeah, not mistaken, <laughs> but uh, I like this version more because it tells a, a more linear story as opposed to the original version. Now, yeah, Little Women coming in at number five. Uh, obviously, uh, because any movie that I'm in is uh, going to be a hit. I, so yeah. I got to be background on this. I don't think you even see me at all. You see like the swishing of a blue dress for like two seconds. You but made that what's, movie. What's great about Little Women 2 is that when they were casting, we brought you the casting calls for Little Women. Yeah. Just like we brought you the casting calls for Boston Strangler. And now it's up on the big screen. So uh, if you stick with us here on the Hub on Hollywood, we will help you get into not only little movies, but some of the best movies of all time that are filming here in Massachusetts and New England constantly. So Black Panther is number six. Black Panther Wakanda Forever, uh, Mm -hmm. where a number of chase scenes were filmed in Boston proper and also in Worcester. Very exciting. One of the bigger box office hits of the last year. Yeah, definitely. And uh, coming in at number seven, I was actually kind of surprised by this one, but uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's 2006 classic Borat did film a few scenes here in Massachusetts. Uh, he played, the, of course, the fictional Kazakhstan reporter making his way across the U.S., which was a hilarious movie. The sequel came out a couple of years ago. And then at number seven, rather number eight, Don't Look Up with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, uh, the global Mm -hmm. warming social commentary movie (laughs) shot here in Boston and in Brockton. Yes. Yeah, that came out awesome. The incredible, the incredible cast on this one, you know, besides Leo and and (laughs) J-Law, Kate Blanchett, Meryl Streep, Timothee Charlemagne, again, uh, Mark Rylance, Ariana Grande, Jonah Hill, when they when they all took over uh, this city, I mean the the celebrity uh, sightings were just out of control. This one was also filmed in the heart of the pandemic, so yeah. a lot of people who were cast as background or supporting in this film actually had to live in hotels for sometimes months at a time away from their families uh, in order to make this film as great as it ended up being. Great dedication and work from the, the big, you know, LA celebs and the, local, you know, and the local actors and filmmakers alike to continue to bring these great uh, films to the big screen for us. Coming in at number nine, The Equalizer filmed primarily in Salisbury. Yeah, Denzel Washington uh, led Thriller, uh, made $193 million at the box office, which has led to sequels and a TV series uh, starring Queen Latifah. So The Equalizer, <laughs> can't uh, forget that one. And coming in at number 10, drum roll, The Firm, the second oldest film on the list that starts out with a young Tom Cruise graduating from Harvard Law School, where he starts working at a law firm, but then he finds out that there are more mischievous and deadly consequences for working there. Uh, that movie I have not seen, but uh, gets really good ratings, of course, making number 10 on this uh, Bad Massachusetts top 10 list, and so I will mm-hmm. add it to my own list to watch. Mm-hmm. Now, there are a number of things that I'm surprised that are not in this top 10. Okay. Um, there are a few uh, films that I feel like definitely deserve to be there, maybe more than some others. Um, I mean, you've got the some of the greatest crime films of all time. You've got uh, Black Mass, about the, the story about American mobster Whitey Bulger, starring Johnny Depp and Dakota Johnson. The Town, you know, with Ben Affleck again, and Jeremy Renner, Blake Lively, John Hamm. And also uh, something that was more recent and uh, a funner, and I think is a new Christmas classic, Spirited, the movie yeah. uh, Spirited, um, starring Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell, and it's their sort of take on A Christmas Carol, uh, and it's a musical that was filmed um, all around uh, uh, Boston. And I think it's a it's a new classic. I think it's on level with Elf, if not, you know, just a little bit below Elf right now, but give it time. Yeah. I think it's a brand new uh, Christmas classic that people are going to be watching uh, every year. No, it's a very good one. So a lot of really great Boston movies. What what's your what would make your top five list for 
the best uh, Massachusetts-based movies out there. Uh, let us know down in the comments down below at Hub on Hollywood. As Jamie said, we are on all the social media platforms. If you're watching us on YouTube, comment down below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. And if you are listening to us on any of the major podcasting streaming services, please leave a five-star review. It really helps out. Now, let's talk about another movie that may be considered a classic, uh, especially depending on how well they do at the Oscars. The new film, Banshees of Inishirin, with nine Oscar nominations this year. I just watched this. It came out at the end of last year. I just watched it on HBO Max. And let me tell you, this is a really, really good great film that has you laughing at one moment and then the next moment uh, you're covering your mouth and shaking your head in disbelief this is a really great film that uh that i highly recommend but without giving any spoilers away this is a story about two lifelong friends who find themselves at an impasse when one abruptly ends their relationship with alarming consequences for both of them uh, this takes place on the fictional island of Inishirin off the coast of Ireland in 1923. It's during a, a period of civil war, but this island is mostly left untouched by the outside conflict. Uh, though there is a lot of symbolism between the two friends, their island, and the war that's, that's going on on the mainland. Uh, we have Colin Farrell playing uh, Padraig. Carrie Condon playing his sister. Brandon Gleeson uh, plays Colin Farrell's former friend, Colm. And Barry Keoghan... Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he was also in Eternals, but he but he plays Dominic, uh, the town outcast, dimwit, troublemaker of sorts. Like I mentioned, I, I cannot recommend this movie uh, more. There are moments where you are laughing, you're crying with tears, and then there are several moments where, again, you're just in utter disbelief. And for me, my jaw was dropped. My jaw dropped several times during this film, and I'm like, oh my god, they did that. That just happened. Like I said, it's a comedy drama, plenty of laughs, and plenty of drama. A lot of people could view this movie as a very small consequences kind of a story, but for these two people and for the community who live on this very small island where everybody knows each other, when somebody decides not to be your friend anymore very abruptly, it feels like you are you lost a member of the family and you don't know what to do because you're going to see this person every single day, but this person wants nothing to do with you, and it's heartbreaking for that person. Uh, this film was written and directed by Martin McDonough, who has worked with Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson before. He's known for movies in Bruges, Seven Psychopaths, uh, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. All excellent films. If you haven't seen those films, they're incredible. So, uh, again, without spoilers, I recommend watching this. It is out on HBO Max, and you may be able to find it on some other uh, streaming platforms. But The Banshees of Inishirin. Yes. I love, love stories like that, that, you know, they give it, they give the story time to breathe and they're really addressing like your deepest insecurities and your deepest inner turmoil. And it's, you know, something so small can make such a, a tremendous significance in your life. Um, and I know how that feels. I had a, I had a very close friend who had a, you know, after she got her nose job, she decided to drop all of oh, her wow. friends. Yeah, in high school. So it was like right after we graduated, she got a nose job and then decided to drop all of her friends. And wow. um, we could not convince her otherwise. And, you know, just that feeling, that's what this story reminds me of, uh, that feeling. And I've totally gotten over it, by the way. I'm not bitter <laughs> and I, I'm totally, completely over it, Muriel. And, yeah, um, oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm totally okay. So, yeah. no, I'm kidding. But it's, it's, you know, it's moments like that in life that when you take the time to, like, deeply explore them, you know, it's great cinema and it's great storytelling. It's that human experience. So I love movies like that that are, you know, courageous enough to let the story breathe. Yeah. Um, I will say this last part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I, though I do recommend watching this movie, I do also recommend watching it with subtitles because uh, this <laughs> is this movie is played with I Irish actors in Ireland uh, with uh, with and the and the accents is very thick as yeah. if you know and, yeah. and and so that's the thing with like Irish and Scottish accents are very very tough for people who are not familiar with it and so this is a movie that that I think the first minute or two watching this I'm like okay I got to restart with subtitles on because there are many things I was missing even in the first two minutes so watch it highly recommend it with subtitles. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. We are, uh, 
That's a great recommendation. I will do that again. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. There's one more thing that I want to mention before we say adios to uh, some of the people who are listening to us. Um, just going back to Boston Strangler, which we're all very excited coming out on Hulu. We had the casting agent, the casting director for a Boston Strangler on the Hub on Hollywood, one of our many amazing interviews with uh, the, the, the local talent and filmmakers and the people who make these incredible movies possible. Um, so that was a fascinating um interview with Billy Dowd. Be sure to go back and check that one out. He's responsible for casting movies like Good Morning Vietnam, Black Hawk Down, uh, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. Like His filmography is just so impressive and we were so happy to have him on. And the last thing, before we get into casting calls, um, we did put out some, uh, we did share some castings for, Bos for Boston Strangler before it came out. And one of them, I was so disappointed that I didn't get, James, oh, no. that I put in for it. They were looking at one point, they put out uh, casting calls for the dead bodies. Oh. For the victims, for the women who were murdered, um, and they were looking for you know very specific, I guess, body types. But it's like um, you had to be okay with nudity, and having your body just splayed out. And um, but you would get principal pay. It was really good pay. You were essentially a, a principal actor with no lines because you were a dead body. Right. Um, That'd be kind so, of freaky, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would love to be a dead body. The the other one I I haven't done yet that I would love to be is a movie monster. Um, mm. So we had a couple of those in the in the past. Um, there was one where they were looking for uh, vampires. They 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 were looking for vampires for uh, one movie in particular. So stick with us as spring rolls around. We will have uh, a lot more castings as um, filming starts to ramp up. Right now it's 15 degrees and and pure ice outside. So once that begins to thaw, so too shall the casting announcements flourish. Um, and balloon. Excellent. And we will share them with you here <laughs> on the Hub on Hollywood. Would you be a dead body in a movie? What 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 would you consider? Um, I'd be a dead body. I'm not sure if I'd go uh, full commando, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can lay on a table for or the ground for several hours and uh, and get paid for that. I, it would have to be a good death. It can't be just like oh, I f was walking and um and a branch fell on my head. I I want to be like I want to go out big. Uh, yeah. Kind of like how Tess went out in uh, episode two of The Last of Us. I want to oh, go okay. guns a blazing, bonds a booming, <laughs> <laughs> or like like ripped in half and oh, like yeah. by monsters kind of thing. Guts, like... blood, all that stuff. So that, that I I, I would love to do that. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. as soon as we hear about it, guys, we will uh, we'll get you in there and and us as well, and we can all hang out on set. Um, so stick around. At the end of this episode, we are going to have um, our casting calls, as we always do. But until then, James, unless you've got anything else to add. No, I think we're good to go. All right. Thanks for being with us on uh, this episode of The Hub on Hollywood. If you want to chat with us and share your experiences on set and what you're doing and what films you're making and what you're acting in, go ahead and reach out to us. Uh, we'll have you on. And until then, we will see you next week. I am Jamie. I'm James. See ya. Bye. James, this is the part of the Hub on Hollywood where we get you in the movies. Thanks for sticking around. Just one casting call for you guys this week that we have. Slate Casting. Now, this one is really cool because we have a huge running community right in Boston. This is where the Boston Marathon is. Tons and tons of runners. So Slate Casting is looking for female marathon runners. Um, this is a nationwide search. Uh, but they don't have to go that far. There's plenty of us here. Uh, well, my husband's a marathon runner. I'm not. I watch. Um, for a super cool project, they're looking for any woman who is currently training or registered for an upcoming full marathon, all 26 miles, between the ages of 18 and 100. Okay? Anyone. Uh, who is an adult. Uh, so they are looking for runners of all types, first timers, costume runners, inspirational runners, wheelchair manufacturers, anybody. 
paid opportunity. If this sounds like you or someone you know, send some photos, tell them about yourself, your marathon journey, and which marathon you're training for. Send that all to Slate real people casting at gmail.com now there should be like a million people applying for this especially in boston because everybody no and their mother is a runner over here i try to be a runner when i first moved over here i, I even bought like you know the short running shorts that that go up to your thigh because yeah, i was like yeah. you know what everyone's wearing those I, I, i'll be i'll be a runner too i bought new shoes i got my short shorts got my sweatband like, all right, I'm going to do this. And for the first month or so, uh, I was a runner. I was like, all right, I'm going to embrace this Boston healthy living. And then shortly after that, I was like, this isn't for me. <laughs> it gets cold over here. And these Look, short shorts are not helping. <laughs> those short shorts accomplished the most important thing. And they, they hooked your wife. Yes. They attracted your wife. And, and now you've, you've got her. So that's all you needed them for. That's, and now that's, neither of us run, which is fantastic. In. Yeah. <laughs> a pair <laughs> made in, in, uh, in heaven. Yeah, you <laughs> should frame them, though, the, the little short shorts, right? <laughs> oh, they are. They are. They're framed. Yeah. They're ready to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass them on to my children <laughs> oh my when they're old enough. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, let us know uh, who are the runners in your life are. Send them a link to this episode and get them uh, in this new project uh, with Slay Casting. Again, casting female marathon runners between 18 and 100 years old. So we want to see you out there. We want to see you running and representing Boston. And tell them that the Hub on Hollywood sent you. The Hub on Hollywood sent you. <laughs> I like that. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next week for another episode and more casting calls. Uh, until then, I'm James. I'm Jamie. Goodbye. <laughs>